Budu saranai sadu sadu sadu. Let me uh, today we are very happy to welcome uh, Bante Sujato, who will be conducting the th third series in our Dhamma discussions that we have been having, the Sutta series, which we have been conducting. We have conducted in two months earlier. Now, this is the third month. That we, so, Bante, we are uh, very, very uh, pay much merit to you for accepting this uh, invitation and for being with us uh, here today. Uh, also, I must mention that we had to do a change in the time because of the uh, advancement in the time of one hour uh, in uh, Sydney and Melbourne. As a result, uh, we have uh, started half an hour early. So I hope that uh, it has not convenienced uh, any uh, our, of our Dhamma friends uh, because it sometimes takes a little time to get adjusted with our earlier time, which we had at 10.30. So now it's uh, from 10 to 12 noon that we will be conducting this. And uh, so today's topic is on Buddha speaks with uh, young people and uh, uh, this is a topic that uh, I think is of great importance uh, to all of us. So uh, just to mention a few things. Uh, now, uh, on behalf of the International Dhamma Program, uh, we are very happy to welcome all our Dhamma friends. And this is, as I said, the, the third series. Third series, I think it's correct, third series. Uh, of the Sutta Lovers program. And uh, as I said earlier, this is directed uh, to the uh, young people, but certainly this message also has to be taken by the elders to the, uh, to the youth of this country. So as I, uh, as we, as I said earlier, it is uh, the Sutta, the today's sessions will be conducted by our respected scholar monk, uh, Bante Sujato, and as I, and also we are doing this in collaboration with uh, SutaCentral.com, Sydney, Australia. Now, uh, uh, all of, I, I do hope that all of you all would have had a chance to go into Sutta Central because uh, that is an English uh, translation, the work of uh, Bante Sujato, as I mentioned here, more than huh, 1 million words, Pali words, which have been translated and available on the website and uh, that uh, it will be very, very useful to our Dhamma friends uh, to visit this and also to gain uh, more knowledge. So uh, we are very uh, grateful to uh, the great services rendered by Bhante Sujato to the, to the Dhamma and also for making it available to the uh, uh, public and also to all our Dhamma friends. So. Uh, as I said, Ms. Deepika Virakun is uh, one who has been here helping us, coordinating all these matters. And then uh, with her great support uh, and assistance, uh, Bante, we have been able to make all these arrangements. So I'm very happy that uh, the Bante has a very, very able uh, trust administrator who is uh, doing things uh, uh, yeah, and giving a lot of benefit to our Dhamma friends. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So uh, now today's session, as I said, we will have the uh, uh, the uh, Dhamma talk that uh, Bante Sujato will be delivering. But in addition to that, uh, I made a request for Bante to have uh, 10 to uh, 15 minutes uh, of guided meditation. Bante guided uh, would be very good so that everyone will be okay. uh, able to learn and do it uh, well. So that will also be very useful. I must also mention of our members who are present here, Mr. Uh, Kamal Nilavira, our uh, member from the UK, who is helping us a great deal, and all the other uh, Dhamma friends who have been helping us. So uh, uh, let me, without uh, any further uh, details, uh, uh, invite uh, Venerable Bhante Sujato to uh, deliver Pansil and uh, commence the Dhamma. Uh, 
Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambudhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambudhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambudhasa. Buddhang saranang gachami, dhammang saranang gachami, sanghang saranang gachami, dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami, dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami, Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami, tatiyampi buddhang saranang gachami, tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami, tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Anati pata veramani si kapadang samadiyami. Adinadana veramani si kapadang samadiyami. Kame sumichachara veramani si kapadang samadiyami. Musavada veramani si kapadang samadiyami. Sura meraya majapamadatana veramani si kapadang samadiyami. Imani pancha si kapadani si lena sugatinyan ti si lena mahoda sampada. Silena ni buting yang tidak semasi langwi sudahye. Satu 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 satu. Okay, very good. Um, so yes, thank you so much uh, to Lakshman and to the International Dharma Program for inviting me and hosting the event once more. Thanks so much to Deepika for helping organize everything so well as always. And thank you to the wonderful engineers at Zoom who have kept all of this stuff alive and the internet engineers and all of the programmers out there. I'm sure that there are some programmers and developers who are out there who keep software going. And sometimes we don't realize how much hard work it takes to do all of these things. So I, uh, because I work with, my work is sort of central, you realize how complex these things are and how difficult they are. So I really appreciate the work that people put in. Okay, so for today, uh, oh, let me begin by uh, acknowledging that I'm giving this talk on the uh, land of the Baramadigal people. So the Baramadigal were the indigenous uh, peoples who were here long before the white skinned folk like myself arrived, my ancestors arrived uh, 200 something years ago. And there were already people here for tens of thousands of years before that time. And the people in this area are called the Baramadigal and they belong to the Darug nation. So they looked after this land and cared for it for tens of thousands of years. So I give them my respects uh, and uh, appreciation for what they have done. Now, um, so the topic for today is the Buddha speaks to young people. Let me begin by uh, sharing. Okay, let me begin by uh, sharing a screen. I'm gonna read a sutta to begin with, and then we'll, I'll come back and we'll talk about it. And then we will see how to proceed. Okay, no, cancel one. One, give me one second. What are we doing here? Uh, the software updated here. Ha, ah, there we go. Okay, right. Let me try once more. Okay. How are we going for screen sharing? Are you good? All see. right, all right, good, good. Okay, good. very good. So this is a very short, simple sutta. Uh, this is in the Udana, which I've translated as the heartfelt saying. And this is a Kumaraka Sutta, the Sutta with the boys. 
So have I heard. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's Grove and Atapindika's monastery. Now, at that time, between Savati and the Jeta Grove, several boys were term tormenting some fish. Then the Buddha robed up in the morning and taking his bowl and robe, he entered Savati for arms. He saw the boys tormenting the fish. He went up to them and said, boys, do you fear pain? Do you dislike pain? Yes, sir, they replied. We dislike pain. Then knowing the meaning of this, on that occasion, the Buddha expressed this heartfelt sentiment. If you fear pain, if you dislike pain, don't do bad deeds, either openly or in secret. If you should do a bad deed, now or in the future, you won't be free from suffering, though you fly away and flee. Okay. So this is the uh, uh, Kumarika Sutta. So if you want to read it, you can look in the uh, um, Sutta Central uh, at Udana 5.4. Uh, and uh, I'll just stop the screen sharing for, uh, oh, no, actually, I'll keep the screen sharing for a minute. I'll just give a, a, a close commentary on the Sutta, uh, which just will take a minute before coming and having more discussion. But uh, so here we see the Buddha, uh, as so often, staying in Savati. One little detail about this, which is uh, quite interesting, is that the Buddha encounters these boys in between Savati and the Jeta's Grove. So normally uh, we assume that, uh, you know, we say the Buddha is staying at Savati, but actually he was staying in a monastery which was a little bit outside the city. So he would walk in to the city for his arms round in the morning and then walk back out again. Uh, and this sort of, that's what we kind of normally assume. But this sort of then confirms it, and it shows that that's uh, you know the, that's what the Buddha was doing. Um, the boys are tormenting some fish, playing around with them, and so on. Boys will be boys, I guess. Uh, we'll come back to this theme a bit later on. Uh, another one which I just mentioned, and this is just one of those little kind of idioms uh, where I've said the Buddha robed up in the morning, and uh, one of the things about this is that. Uh, in the Pali, basically, it says that he puts, he puts his robes on in the morning. And when, when you kind of read that, I don't know, in the, 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 the previous English translations would be like, the, you know, the Buddha put his, put his robe on in the morning. And it's like, well, was he, was he naked before that or something like that? And I'm like, it just didn't sound quite right. So when I say robed up, what it means is that, of course, he always wears, he's wearing his lower robe, which he would wear in the monastery. Uh, and then puts the upper robe on, which is, that's what it means to robe up, is to put the upper robe on, uh, ready to go into town. So taking his bowl and robe, uh, arms bowl, and then he saw those kids there, saw the boys, and then asked them those questions. Do you, did you fear pain? Do you dislike pain? We dislike pain. If you fear and dislike pain, don't do bad deeds, either openly or in secret. If you should do a bad deed now or in the future, you won't be free from suffering, though you fly away and flee. All right, so that's just a brief word commentary on, on uh, some of the, uh, uh, a, few, a few aspects of the sutta. I'll just stop sharing for now. So this, uh, this very little sutta is uh, one that I have always remembered and which uh, uh, strikes me, uh, it, one of those kind of small little suttas which uh, in a way, you can almost sort of pass by. Um, but it tells us some very interesting things about who the Buddha was and about how he approached teaching. And I'm going to come back to some of those things uh, throughout this course. But the, most, the first thing and the most obvious thing here is when the Buddha uh, is speaking to those boys is that he is not uh, scolding them. He is not talking down to them. He is not telling them what to do. He's asking them a question. Do you fear pain? He's, 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 he's treating them with respect, even though absolutely they were being bad, right? No doubt about it. They were being naughty. And, but the way to stop being, people being naughty, well, it depends, right? I mean, there's no there's no easy answers because sometimes you just have to stop people, right? I mean, sometimes that's all you can do. And, you know, th that's just life. Sometimes people just want to do something bad and you have to stop them, unfortunately, but not always. And 
sometimes, and in fact, I think quite often, when people are doing something that's bad or something that's wrong, then uh, it helps or it's more useful to engage with them, to treat people with respect, to treat them with dignity, and to lead them to understand the consequences of what they're doing. Now, in this particular case, um, uh, in this particular case, the, the Buddha um, uh, uses a simple form of what in philosophy is known as a Socratic uh, dialogue. And so what a Socratic dialogue, what the sort of the means or the method that Socrates used was that he would uh, always uh, um, assume that there was a common, he would begin with a common ground or find a common ground between him and the person he was trying to persuade. And refer to something which appeared to be self-evident to both of them. And then he would lead that person step by step along a path and see what the conclusion that they would come to. And so this is, this is what's called Socratic method. It's a method of uh, argumentation uh, in philosophy. And the, this is what the Buddha is doing here. So he doesn't begin by telling them, you know, you're bad children. He doesn't say by saying you're naughty. He doesn't begin by saying, stop doing this. So he's not like, he's not criticizing them and he's not uh, ordering them around, but instead he's respecting them and asking them questions. Do you like pain? I mean, okay, it's a leading question. Yeah, of course they don't like pain, yeah? but it's coming from them. And then he's leading them to see the connection between them and the fish, that the fish also don't like pain. This actually is the root of the word education. And not many people realize that these days, but the word education it comes from that old Greek method as used by Socrates and the, the literal meaning of it, like the word, the, the root uh, 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 du or duck in, in, the, in that word, education, the duck is like a duct, right? So it's like a pipe or a duct, something, something that you can uh, draw out. And the E is the, is the out part of it. So to, to, e, to educe, is to draw out something. And this is what education means, is to draw out knowledge, draw out wisdom, draw out skills. And it's a very uh, beautiful and very compassionate way of thinking about education. Interestingly enough, in terms of etymology, this is uh, practically identical with the Pali word that we know uh, as Vinaya. So when we talk about Vinaya, you probably think the Vinaya means the rules for monks and nuns, which, yes, that's true. So we have the Vinaya Pitaka, which is the collection of rules and other procedures and teachings for that govern the monks and nuns community. So people often think that uh, the word Vinaya means like discipline or something like that. But that's not really what the word means. I mean, that's an application of the word, but the, the root meaning of the word actually is the same. It's to lead out. And to, the Buddha actually spoke about the vinaya, the leading out of greed, hate, and delusion. Right? So you'd, you'd lead these things away. So it's the same meaning actually as education. So education, you use it in a positive sense, right? to, to lead out a person's potential, a person's talent, a person's possibilities. And this is where we have to start when we're thinking about education. And Buddhism is always a, uh, a path that sees such a profound potential in all people. This is where we have to start. I mean, we can all be enlightened, all of us whether the youngest newborn baby, the children, us, even, even that criminals and killers. And we know stories like Angulimala and other stories, people who have been down the path of terrible evil, still 
have that capacity for redemption and they have that capacity to become enlightened. So fundamentally, Buddhism, it has an incredibly positive view of human nature because it teaches us that we can overcome, that whatever the situation that we're in, no matter how deep and how dire, and no matter how many mistakes we make, there is a path back and there is a path from suffering to happiness, from bondage to freedom, a path from darkness to light. And we can be drawn out and guided along that path. Now, the Buddha very famously said that he cannot by himself um, make someone get enlightened. He cannot bring somebody alone across the flood. But when we want to, when we make that decision that we want to cross the flood, then we can, we can, he can, he can give us the help and the guidance and the support to do that. So again, in Buddhism, we have this very positive idea of human nature and human potential. And we also have that sense of inner responsibility that we have to make the choice to cross the flood. When we recited the five precepts at the start of this session, that recitation also um, uh, embodies that same principle. And sometimes people compare the five precepts with the Ten Commandments. And sure, there are some things in common with the Ten Commandments, but there are also some things that are different. And one of the things that's different is that precepts are not commandments. The precepts is not the Buddha saying, you must do this. Thou shalt. That's not what it says in the precepts. What it says in the precepts is sikapadang samadhyami. I shall undertake the way of training. I undertake. I, first person, present tense, singular, active, indicative verb. I undertake it. You know, this is something I am doing right now. And so again, that doesn't mean that our path is uh, you know, completely individual, right? It doesn't mean that we can't be, you know, giving each other help and support. And sometimes, you know, stopping it, stopping people from doing things or whatever. I mean, sometimes, like I said, sometimes we have to do it. But as far as we can, our starting point is to start where that person is and to draw out the potential of that person as best we can. Now, I mentioned before about the uh, education theories of Socrates, and it really is remarkable that this idea is, is the fundamental idea that underlies education as we know it globally today. And Socrates was one of the first people who advanced the then revolutionary idea that anybody can be taught. And for much of the world, and you know, I think probably still for a lot of the world today, there was this kind of belief that, well, education is only for the few, for the elite. Well, there are some people who deserve an education. Yeah? And if you're born into the right family, born with the right connections, then you might get an education in certain things. But Socrates came with this rather radical idea that everybody can be educated. And he proved it uh, by uh, teaching a young boy. And one of his dialogues, I can't recall the name of the dialogue now, but one of his dialogues, they was having this discussion with people. And this person was saying, you know, it's not the case that everybody can understand geometry. And geometry at the time was you know, one of the most advanced uh, of the uh, mathematics and sciences, and uh, it was considered to be a very difficult and abstruse subject. I mean, these days we, we teach it in, in primary school. But, uh, and Socrates, and the reason that we can do that is because of Socrates. And Socrates says, no, it's not true. He said, look, I'll show you. Here's this, this slave boy who was with them, this unlettered kid 
who had had no opportunity for an education, had no advantages, nothing. And he's got, got they, they smoothed out a bit of dirt and they drew lines on the ground. And he said, okay, so if I take this line, I draw from here to here, and then started leading this boy through a geometric proof. And each step of the way, he made sure that the boy understood and was following him. And he could lead him to understand uh, this geometric proof. And that is the foundation on which our modern education is based. The idea that we can all understand. And it's the same thing that the Buddha taught, that we can all understand. Interestingly enough, if we ask, why did Socrates believe this? Why did he think that we all had this potential to understand? The reason that he gave uh, was that we have already learned these things in our past lives. And Socrates, like most of the ancient Greek philosophers, believed in rebirth. And he believed that we had been born countless times in the past and that when we were born in this life, that we forgot most of what we'd learned in the past. Maybe there were traces left behind. So what, we, what we're doing when we are uh, to go, walking somebody through a proof is that we are um, making those connections and drawing out that potential of somebody that has been, been lost or been temporarily forgotten. And I think this is also another really important aspect of education is that um, you know, when we think about education, we think about putting things in, whereas really the most important thing is how do we get things out? And like Socrates, I too believe that we've been born many times in the past and that knowledge is there. And even if we're not thinking in terms of rebirth, just in terms of, say, schooling and the classroom, you know, you go to the class when things are spoken and when something's read in a book or something like that, it's there. And I believe that those things are not really lost. I think that they, those memories stay there and that they are accessible and they can be brought to the fore. And so a lot of what we need to consider, sometimes when we're considering education, you know, you think when people are, uh, you know, kids are uh, learning and studying and so on, then it's all about, you know, how many times you can read the books and how many times you can go over the lessons and how many times you can put things in. But if instead we think of our mind as being like water, like the Buddha said, you know, the mind is like water, then to be able to see what's in the mind depends on the clarity and the stillness of the water. And so this is the role that meditation plays because meditation makes the mind still and that stillness then lets those teachings come to the fore. I'll, I'll be talking more about that later on. So, so far I've been talking about the Socratic method and I've been talking about um, the, uh, the manner in which the Buddha approached the teaching for these uh, boys. Uh, I haven't spoken so far on the content of the teaching, but the content of the teaching here is also equally important. And so clearly the Buddha is teaching the first precept to not kill. And so this was one of the most pertinent things for those kids. Now, you know, those boys, they were kind of being cruel. And that's sometimes what boys do, right? Unfortunately, I'm guessing girls do it as well, but <laughs> I don't know, mostly, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not going to go into the, whether there's a gender difference there or anything, but certainly boys can be sometimes cruel. And such an important part of our development, our, our own personal moral development 
is realizing that sense of connection, that sense that others feel this pain. This is what we call empathy or compassion, karuna, anukampa. That idea that we are not so very different from these other creatures. This idea, and it's not, obviously, it's not just creatures. Sometimes it's, you know, other humans, you know, kids or adults or whatever. And young people can be cruel. And they do that unthinking. And they do that without empathy, without taking that effort. It's, it, to, to empathize takes effort. And the more different that something is, then the more effort that it takes to empathize. If somebody doesn't look like you, if somebody doesn't talk the same language as you, if somebody is uh, a different skin color, a different religion, some of these are different race or different species, then it's harder to empathize. But this is the reality. If we look in the world and we look at all of the living creatures in the world, we can see that uh, all of these different creatures that we have so much in common with them. Just uh, uh, yesterday, there's a, a, a viral video that came past of a bear. And this was a very lovely, very simple video. A guy is just sitting beside a river in Alaska, looking over the river, having a picnic or something. And there's a beautiful view of the river and then all the lands beyond. And then all out of nowhere, this bear comes up. And big brown bear and just sort of sits beside him, ambles around, shuffles around a bit, and then just sits next to him and then just checks out the view. Just sitting there watching out, looking over the river, and just this, this human and this bear sitting side by side, just enjoying the view and enjoying that nice peaceful moment together. Imagine that would be such an incredible thing to, to just to happen. And when you see that, you feel such a strong emotional response because you, you recognize yourself in that bear. You know, it's just, it's just enjoying life. It's just coming along. It's just having a nice time. And you see that connection. So when the Buddha was teaching about this precept, you know, he didn't say to the boys, don't kill. He didn't say to the boys, stop it. He didn't say to the boys, you're being bad. He said to the boys, do you like feeling pain? So he's asking them to reflect. He's treating what they have to say with dignity and respect. He wants to hear from them. And he is giving them the trust that they will know what is the right thing to do. Yeah. So these, this is, I think, a really powerful blueprint for education. Now, education is not just one thing, right? Many things, many complicated things. And I, I should say right from the beginning that as we're going to be doing this and exploring this over this period, I am no expert. I'm absolutely no expert in education. I, I know something about the suttas. I don't know much. I've never been a father. I've never raised kids. I've never been a school teacher. And I'm sure that there are many people who are listening to this who know far more about these things than I do. So, you know, please, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not meaning to, um, you know, try to pretend that I know more about these things than you do. Absolutely, I do not. But what I can do is to bring this idea, this perspective of how, what the Buddha said, how the Buddha approached it uh, to the Buddhist community. And look, this is something that, you know, 
over many years, you know, I've had many discussions with many people about these kinds of questions. How do we share Dharma with younger people? How do we keep that tradition alive? How do we, uh, how do we, you know, how do we bring people along in these different times and so on? And in all of those discussions, I, to be honest, I can't recall a single time when I heard anybody say, well, I wonder how the Buddha did that. I wonder how the Buddha talked to young people. Did he talk to young people? How did he, how did he go about it? Yeah. So we know, hopefully, from this one sutta, we've hopefully answered a few of those questions. Yes, he did talk with younger people. Uh, we, you know, there's not so many teachings with younger people in the suttas. Right? There are some more, and we'll be looking at those during the course, but there's not that many. Most of the time his teachings was with adults. Um, so we know, but we know that he did speak with younger people. We know something about uh, some of the methods or ideas that he would use. And uh, we can see that we can see that in the spirit that he was teaching for these kids is not so very different from how he would teach adults. And so those of you who have been uh, following through my, my course recently on the Attika Vagga, uh, you know, you, you will recall how uh, the Buddha was uh, very engaging. He was very um, like encouraging of inquiry, uh, that he was, um, um, he would be, he would, he would speak in a way that engaged with the intelligence and the integrity of the people to whom he was talking. So he preferred to do that rather than simply be lecturing at people. And so it's about speaking with people and about getting people to reflect and about drawing people along uh, through the power of persuasion. So my hope is that through doing this series, that we can uh, learn something about how the Buddha spoke with younger people. It's something that I hope to learn from as well as we go on. And it's not something that I've you know, looked at and studied a huge amount in the past. So I'm, I'm planning on sort of doing the study and, and learning about it as we go. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure where we're going to end up. I mean, I've got a reasonable idea but uh, we may well be taking some different roads and different paths as we go. People are different. Young people are different. Parents are different. Situations are different. And times are different. So we can't always just take, like, literally exactly the thing that's there in the suttas and then just apply it in our world. Our world is very different. And this is also another thing which I think we really have to bear in mind uh, when we're thinking about these things. It's the change. It's the the, the the change of time, impermanence. And here we are on Zoom, sharing Dhamma all across the world, and we have to worry about: uh, can people attend because of time zones and things like that? That's not something the Buddha ever had to worry about. Uh, we, have, we have to worry about internet connections. We have to worry about, well, we had a, a thunderstorm here a little while ago. So is it going to be interrupted by a thunderstorm? These are our concerns, but they weren't concerns from the time of the Buddha. So the way that we do things changes. And look, it's a cliche, but we all know this, that our times are changing so fast, so incredibly fast and faster than any period of time in history and it continued, continuing to accelerate. And I mean, who knows where we're going and who knows where all this is coming? There's so much uncertainty. Just this morning, uh, I was having a conversation with one of my friends, Dummett in, in um, Canberra, and uh, he's a robotics engineer. And he said he wanted to, he proposed that I would uh, advise on a, a PhD thesis for doing a mindfulness robot. So they're going to try to figure out how to do a mindful. I said, oh, that sounds like fun. They had sure I'd be happy to do that. I've got no idea what it involves, but that's kind of the idea, right? Can we use you know, technology in a way that's going to be supportive of people's peace of mind? 
So um, these are the things that's happening all around us. And one of the things that that means is that how education happens and how Dhamma is transmitted is going to be different. Right? That's just the fact. We know that. It's going to be different. You know, one of the things that I've done a few times when I've been at the house done is here in Sydney, and I would go to a, like a family, and sometimes there was like three generations in the family, the grandparents, the parents, and the kids. And we have a conversation about how they've all learned the Dhamma. And one of the things that's really interesting about this is that they've all learned the Dhamma in completely different ways. You know, those three generations, you know, maybe the grandparents learned Dhamma at a, a temple in a village. You know, maybe the uh, uh, parents learned Dhamma by going to Sunday school in Bajirarama or something like that. You know, maybe the kids are learning online or something. And it's, it's completely different environment and context for each generation. And our generation coming up is also going to be different. So, you know, that doesn't mean that we just abandon or give up the past, right? Because the past needs to inform the future. But it does mean that we need to change. We need to adapt and we need to be ready to innovate and to try out new things. Not every time will it work. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. But we need to try new things. So this is just some thoughts for you initially based on that first very short sutta. And we will, I'll come back to some more ideas as we go along, but I'm just looking at the time, looks like it's quarter past. So we've been going for about an hour or something like that now already. So why don't we just do, do our meditation break now? And then I'll look at a couple of more suttas afterwards. Okay, so let's do some guided meditation. <clears throat> All right, so I want to get you, I want to ask you to please sit um, in, a, in, a, in a good posture for meditation. If you're sitting on a floor, on the floor, then, um, you know, sit with a, uh, a decent cushion so that your back can be reasonably straight. Your legs and knees on the ground. If you're sitting on a chair, and don't, don't sit on a chair that's too sloppy, like a couch or something like that. But sit on a chair where you can be reasonably uh, alert and upright. And learn how to sit so that you can feel balanced and alert. Pay attention to your posture. Now close your eyes, bring the mind into the present. And feel the gentle feeling of the breath as it comes in and goes out. Breath coming in, breath going out. Breath coming in, breath going out.
and then feeling the peacefulness, feeling the coolness of the breath. Don't try to focus or concentrate too hard on the breathing. Don't worry about it. The breath is there. The present is there. You don't have to go chasing it. Let it come to you. Be mindful. Let the breath come to you. Let the breath calm you down. Breath coming in and breath going out. Breath coming in and breath going out. Easy, steady. Just that gentle feeling, so soothing, so soft.
Okay, so coming near to the end of the meditation. Come back into your senses. Hear the sounds around. Feel the touch of your cloth on your skin. And take a minute to reflect back over the meditation. Ask yourself, what just happened? How did my mind change? Why did it change? What was it that was making my mind agitated, distracted? What was it that was making my mind peaceful, content? And finally, we can dedicate the merit of our practice. May all beings be happy. May all beings be well. May all beings realize Nibbana. Sad, sad, sad. Okay, very good. So now you can open your eyes, come out of meditation. Very good. So this is one of those things that you know I was talking about with that idea of education is drawing out. So when the mind is clear, calm, relaxed, peaceful, then things will come to the surface. And this is something that happens so very commonly in meditation. Now, the Buddha said that samadhi upanisa yatabhut dasana. that samadhi, stillness, deep, deep stillness and immersion of the mind leads to the knowledge and vision of things as they really are. Now, when the Buddha was talking about that, he was talking about it, of course, at the very highest level of insight into the nature of the truth. But the same principle applies at any level. Yeah? Meditation helps you to see things more clearly. It helps you to realize and to understand things. And there's be so many times when I'm meditating and then just some answer will come to your mind. And it's not always some profound thing or, or some profound realization. It might be a solution to some problem that I've been worrying about, or maybe I forgot where I put something and then oh, it comes to my mind and I remember where it was, or it could be so many things. But it's the same idea. When your mind is peaceful, things will come to the surface. And underlying that is that idea that, that things don't get lost. This is why we can recollect even what we had in our past lives. Think about it. If it's possible through meditation to recollect even what's happened in our past lives, shouldn't it be possible to be able to recollect what happened this morning or in the classroom or last week? Yeah. Again, that's the power of meditation. And while sure, most of us are not going to be great meditation masters who are practicing fourth jhana or something like that. But still, even a little bit that we can do is going to be really helpful to uh, find the answer. And, you know, you can, you know, the opposite of that, like, you know, that if you're trying to, uh, you know, maybe you're in a bad mood, you know, maybe you're angry about something, upset about something. And if you're trying to pay attention, trying to listen to what somebody say or trying to, to learn something, and it's just really hard because your mind keeps on going off and keeps on going back to this angry emotion and keeps on getting caught up in these thoughts and you can't pay attention. Yeah? This is how we learn. When our mind is clear, we can learn. All right, let's come back. Uh, oh, let's see for first. Um, I might just see if we've got any questions uh, as we go along the way. So I might just address a couple of questions uh, as we go. So we've got the first question here uh, from Anonymous. How's it going, Anonymous? Where you are, I hope that you are happy and your family and everyone you know is happy as well. Uh, Anonymous asks, is it a myth that young people have less fetters? It would be easier for them to grasp a deep dhamma quickly than more mature people. Yes, I think that's a bit of a myth. I, uh, I think that um people have you know people are people are different you know there are young people who are very quick to grasp the dhamma and there are young people who are very hard to grasp it and same with older people as well 
I think everybody has their own life experiences. I mean, obviously, you know, I think it is true that with younger people, there is a more kind of like, like a curiosity and a more ability to like soak up and learn knowledge, you know, and that's obviously can be really great. But on the same time with older people, then we have wisdom of experience and uh, so on to draw on. So I think that it's, it just kind of depends. I don't think that you can make generalizations too much like that. Uh, so Putrika, yes, so they've asked about the <coughs> Putrika asked about the biomedical people. Yes, so thanks, uh, Jan, uh, Jan Han, I think. Uh, Jan Ha, who so correctly spelt it, the biomedical people. So this is our region that we are is Parramatta. Actually, I'm in the suburb of Harris Park, which is just next to Har Parramatta. Parramatta is one of the main regional, sorry, not regional, but main sort of secondary city centres in Sydney. And um, uh, and it's named after, of course, the, the local Indigenous people were here, the, the Paramadigal people. Uh, and not much is known about them. Uh, they, because this, this land was uh, settled fairly early on in the Sydney colony, um, the uh, most of the Paramadigal people, unfortunately, were displaced from the region and or killed, a lot died in disease and so on. Uh, and so there's no kind of local population of Barramadigal people here, uh, so far as I know. Uh, obviously there are some Aboriginal people around the place, but they come from different areas and not necessarily locals. So uh, I, I'm not aware that there's a sort of on, uh, uh, an ongoing continuity of tradition among the Barramadigal people, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, let's come back to some suttas and I'll, well, let's have a look at a few more suttas uh, to get, you know, maybe some more perspectives on how the Buddha was dealing with young people. Let's have a look, see what we can find. Okay. <clears throat> so screen sharing once more. Uh, and so now we're looking at another sutta in the Udana. Uh, so this is the uh, Udana 2.3, named a stick. Okay. So I have heard. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jetis Grove. Same setting as the previous one. At uh, that time, in between, uh, um, uh, between Savati and Jetis Grove, uh, several boys were hitting a snake with a stick. Then the Buddha robed up in the morning, taking his bowl and robe, entered Savati for arms. He saw the boys hitting the snake. Knowing the meaning for this, on that occasion, the Buddha expressed this heartfelt sentiment. Creatures love happiness. So if you hurt them with a stick in search of your own happiness, after death, you'll find no happiness. Creatures love happiness. So if you don't hurt them with a stick in search of your own happiness, after death, you will find happiness. So this is obviously a very similar uh, teaching, a very similar setting to the previous one, but the Buddha's approach is a little bit different here. Also a good thing to, to know, right? The Buddha isn't necessarily using the same method exactly every time. In the last sutta, as we saw, the Buddha was, you know, began by engaging with them and asking questions. This, this sutta doesn't mention it. I mean, perhaps, perhaps that was omitted, right? It's not necessarily that it records everything that was said at the time. But anyway, we know that it wasn't there. Kids, the boys, once more, enjoying themselves tormenting animals. Here at Little Snake. Now, presumably, <laughs> could be a dangerous activity, right? And uh, certainly here in Australia, um, poking snakes with sticks is not recommended. Uh, and uh, for anybody's benefit, but particularly for the snake's benefit, and obviously that is one of the main ways that people get hurt, right? By, by uh, you know, poking them or playing with them or something like that. Um, I mean, and then, then it's kind of strange, isn't it? I mean, that question was asked before about um, whether, uh, you know, whether kids were, were more adept at learning Dhamma compared to adults. But it's interesting that, that in these suttas, you know, you're seeing so much of that, that casual cruelty that children can have. And I think this is, this is something which is interesting about the suttas. The suttas aren't uh, sentimentalizing childhood. You know, it's a very, it's very realistic. I mean, it's not, it's not condemnatory, but it's, it's realistic. It still happens today. And there's this kind of funny paradox where the kids on the one hand love animals 
right? I mean, kids love animals and they love playing with their pets and they just loved going to the zoo or they just love animals and yet can also have this kind of casual, unthinking cruelty. And in this particular case, you know, I mean, you're, you're not talking about uh, a snuggly koala bear, right? You're not talking about a puppy, you know, it's a snake, it's a dangerous animal. It's not something that people are going to be, um, uh, you know, thinking of as being sort of cute and, and friendly. Uh, and yet even here, the Buddha is expressing that sense of connection and that sense of oneness. And I think this is really sort of quite remarkable. And again, I think, you know, we need to sort of bear in mind the, the changing times. Um, you know, we live in a time where nature has been defeated effectively. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously not completely, but we don't, you know, we live in safe houses. We're not threatened by tigers. We're not threatened by snakes and these kinds of things. And to a large point, a large extent, the, uh, the kinds of fears that other people might have or that, that people might have had in the past about animals are no longer really kind of present. I mean, just as sort of a simple example uh, of that, if you look in history, for example, that story I gave about the bear earlier, you know, the bear coming. And when we see that video, I mean, we know that a bear is a dangerous animal, but at the same time, when we see that, we feel this kind of love and this joy to see that. Uh, and uh, historically, depictions of bears up until, say, the 19th century uh, were always very negative. And bears were depicted as being, you know, smelly, violent, dangerous animals. Uh, and then only after that, you sort of had the invention of the teddy bear and the idea that bears could be a snuggly thing and they're sort of cuddly and cute. And so we kind of, when we have become distant from nature, we can afford to sentimentalize it and we can afford to look at it and say, oh, yes, we need to preserve the forest. We need to take care of the animals and so on. So it's really interesting to me when I look back two and a half thousand years ago at the Buddha's like unquestioning commitment to caring and compassion for all creatures, even a snake. Yeah, even the little creature, like there's another sutta where a monk is um, baking bricks and the bricks have little creatures in them and he's killing the little creatures by baking the bricks. He says, no, don't, don't kill the little creatures. Even those little things, that compassion. And so, so this is, I think, one, um, you know, this is, this is like this kind of fundamental of morality, the teaching of non-harming the teaching of non-violence, yeah? the most fundamental moral teaching, parnati pata. And this is an in, in terms of how we relate with children and how we can um, draw out that moral potential that children have, because the children have that capacity to love animals have that capacity to love kittens and puppies and yes even snakes and that capacity to empathize with others is is so strong and yet as we see in this sutta it can easily be twisted as well like if that if that if that compassion is not nurtured if it's not drawn out then it can result in these sort of senseless acts of cruelty and violence against against innocent creatures so so this is i think uh another so we've learned a couple of lessons here already in terms of how the buddha was teaching young people the first thing is that the buddha is teaching young people with respect the second thing is that he is he's teaching young people by engaging with them asking questions third thing he's teaching young people by uh addressing uh issues where they can find some common ground yeah? and he's teaching them in a way uh, that grants them agency like they can work out the answers 
All right, so notice how this is framed. This particular one is framed. Creatures love happiness. So if you hurt them with a stick in search of your own happiness, after death, you'll find no happiness. So this is a logical argument. Right? He's giving them a reason, and he's drawing out a conclusion for that reason. And he is, he's treating the kids with, with as if they are intelligent people who are capable of understanding the argument that he's making. So he's not just telling them what is, but he's drawing them along. And this is a crucial educational technique. The way that the human mind is, and human brain is wired is that there are different kinds of uh, knowledge in the human mind. One kind of knowledge is a received knowledge. And the other kind of knowledge is the knowledge that we find out for ourselves. And received knowledge is also is always much less vivid, much less persuasive, much less meaningful to us than knowledge that we have found ourselves. And this is something we all know, right? I mean, we can all know, we've all had that experience where, you know, we have an idea, we find something out, and it's much more powerful and much more meaningful to us because it's what we did. Whereas when somebody tells you that thing, it's much less exciting. It's kind of a bit dull, it's a bit boring, and being just told things all the time is boring. And this is a really powerful insight to understand through education. So as long as education is being felt to be third hand, it's just somebody telling you something, then it never will have that same spark in your mind. It'll never be so meaningful in your mind. Yeah, I mean, that's not to say that we can't do that. Obviously, to a certain extent, you have to do that. I mean, we have to share information. We have to share, you know, knowledge, right? I mean, there's no, you know, there's no, no getting around that. Obviously, we have to do that. But at the same time, we, we, we need to accept the, the limitations of that. Yeah? The knowledge that really matters to people, the ones that will really move, the knowledge that will really move a person is the knowledge that arises within them. And that knowledge that arises within a person is a knowledge that can only come in time for that person. It can't, you know, you can't put it in a curriculum. You can't force them to have it. It will come when that person is ready. There will be a ripeness there. And that ripeness stems from past lives, apart from anything else. So, you know, we can't, we can't predict that. And, you know, this is something that any mother will know is that when she gives birth to a child, that that child <laughs> is its own person. That child comes from her, but it's, it's, it, it's come as a person. And a child is not just stamped out according to our wishes and our desires but they already have such a long 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 history behind them and this is why kids you know even kids brought up in the same family kids brought up in the same environment same conditioning will turn out very very differently yeah. so there needs to be an understanding of for this person at this time what are they ready to hear and how can that be used to help them? Okay, so another thing that we can use, we can find out from this particular passage that's also, I think, interesting and relevant is that the Buddha went to where they were. Now, in this case, he just went by accident, right? He's just, just happened to be going, going along the road and saw this. But the, the point still remains. He went to where they were. He was in their space, if you like. That was they were playing, they were happily doing their kind of thing, and the Buddha wanders past. And so what that means is that the teaching that happens there in their place has a meaning for them in their place. If we take them out of their place into another place, you can give them another lesson. But all too often, that lesson might be just stuck there. It's stuck in a classroom, it's stuck in a temple. And when the kid 
leaves the classroom, they leave the lesson behind. I mean, I'm not saying that happens all the time. I'm just saying that this can be a tendency. So this is, an, and this is another really interesting thing, and I'm not quite sure what the implications of this are. So I'm not really kind of making any specific recommendations here. I'm just sort of noticing how this works, you know? So to rather than thinking, you know, so, so how, how older people tend to think is to say, well, look, how can I get kids to come into our space, you know, bring kids into our classroom or into our temple or something like that? But perhaps another way of looking at that is to say, well, how can we bring the Dharma into their space? How can we bring Dharma onto TikTok, onto YouTube? How can we, how can we find out where, what they're doing is happening and how Dharma can manifest there? And that's not going to be easy all the time, but at least we can start to think about it. All right, so that's just the, that's the, uh, 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 the Danda Sutta, the stick, Udana 2.3. Uh, let's look at another couple of suttas here. All right, so this one is, just make this one thing. So you can see on Sutta Central, you can control the appearance of suttas. So here we have a sutta which has English and Pali. And I'm just going to give you a bit of a demonstration because I like showing these things off. If we want to see a different translation or something like that, we can look in these parallels. We have a couple of translations, a bit of information, and we can look at translations in other languages, Indonesian, Italian, uh, Thai, and so on. And we also have a couple of parallels. So with a couple of other versions of the suttas, we can see there's one uh, in Chinese, and there's also another version of this same sutta elsewhere in the Pali Canon that's in the Sutta Nipata, so the same sutta. Uh, more or less appears in two places. And here we have, these are the uh, different parallels, and these little arrows will indicate the nature of the parallel. So if I hover above that, then this is telling me, give me a little pop-up that's telling me that this is a full parallel. It's telling me that, that these are basically the same sutta, uh, but in, a, in a, just a different version of the same sutta. So sometimes suttas are like that, sometimes suttas are what we call partial pa parallels, which means that maybe part of one sutta is the same as another sutta. So there might be like a section of one sutta which is included in another one. Other suttas are what we call resembling parallels, uh, where there are some kind of generic similarities between them, but they're not really that similar. Uh, and another kind of sutta is, another kind of parallel is a quotation, uh, where you get where one sutta is referred to in another sutta. So even though the sutra itself might not appear, but it's referred to. The Buddha might say, for example, uh, as I taught the 62 views in the Brahmajala Sutta. Uh, and so there's a kind of a parallel there. It's referring to it, but it's not actually found. Anyway, so these are the parallels, which you can find on sort of central. And these are now the views. We're looking at it side by side, but I'm going to switch this to a plain view by clicking that. And good enough. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through this whole... Uh, so there's only one part of it that I want to look at, but the background here, this is the, uh, uh, this is the episode where the Buddha has just been enlightened and the, um, has it just been enlightened or just about to be enlightened? Yeah, I have to look at it anyway. So the, I think it's just been enlightened. And then um, Mara has been trying to dis distract the Buddha from his path for seven years and hasn't worked and he goes up and tries to uh, harass the Buddha and try to um, you know, turn him from the path. Um, and then at the end, poor old Mara uh, loses and the Buddha is not uh, perturbed by his uh, harassment at all. And Mara then gives this rather interesting um, response. So this is, this is Mara speaking now. So suppose there was a lotus pond not far from a town or, and a or village and a crab lived there. Then several boys or girls would leave the town or village and go to the pond where they'd pull out the crab and put it on dry land. So this is, I, I just thought this was interesting. This isn't actually the Buddha talking to 
to young people, but it's still another episode which is interestingly similar to the ones we've seen before. So I just thought I'd mention it here. Whenever that crab extended a claw, those boys or girls would snap, crack and break it off with a stick or a stone. And when that crab's claws had all been snapped, cracked and broken off, it wouldn't be able to return down into that lotus pond. In the same way, sir, the Buddha has snapped, cracked and broken off all my trips, dodges and evasions. Now I'm not able to approach the Buddha again in hopes of finding a vulnerability. And uh, then he went on to recite these verses of disappointment in the Buddha's presence. A crow once circled a stone that looked like a lump of fat. Perhaps I'll find something tender at thought. Perhaps there's something tasty. But finding nothing tasty, the crow left that place. Like the crow that pecked the stone, I leave Gotama disappointed. Poor old Mara. I mean, you've got to feel a bit sorry for him. I mean, he, he you know, he, he, did, he was doing his job. I mean, it might not have been a good job, but he tried, right? You can't, you can't, you can't fault him for not trying seven years. And uh, anyway, so, uh, I mean, it's interesting. Oh, well, actually, this answers the question that I raised earlier. Is, is it just boys who do this kind of cool stuff or do girls do it as well? Well, here, <laughs> we've learned that actually, no, no, girls can actually be just as cruel as boys can. So that's good to know. Um, but it is interesting how this same theme is recurring, right? I mean, it must have been quite a common sight to see. Um, and I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of a bit disturbing, to be honest, you know? And you think about how, the, how kids can be so cruel. Um, so it, I mean, it emphasizes, I think, how important it is to draw out this. And, and I think this, you know, like, like the fact that this is the first precept, it's the foundation of moral life. And when the, when the suttas refer to kids, you know, again and again and again, they're referring to it in terms of this fundamental precept of respect for life. And I think th this is giving us also a, a, a really important um, instruction or guidance as to what we need to do to, uh, uh, to, to awaken the kind of the moral potential uh, of uh, children. All right. And I should say, just by the way, that when I'm talking about um, uh, uh, we're speaking to young people, uh, that it's not just going to be uh, for children, like the ones we're looking at today, uh, what is talking to children or their children are being referred to. Uh, but as we go on, we'll also look at more kind of young adults as well. So that will come up in future weeks. All right, here's another one. Again, this is not specifically the Buddha speaking to young people, but it's an example. Uh, suppose some young, some boys or girls were playing with sandcastles. As long as they're not rid of greed, desire, fondness, thirst, passion, and craving for those sandcastles. They cherish them, fancy them, treasure them, and treat them as their own. But when they are free of greed, desire, fondness, thirst, passion, and craving for those sandcastles, they scatter, destroy, and demolish them with their hands and feet, making them unplayable. So here the Buddha is giving an um, uh, a, uh, analogy. Uh, and one of the many, very, you know, hundreds of very vivid uh, analogies that the Buddha gives throughout the suttas uh, of children playing with sand castles. And once again, so interesting always to see how the games that kids are playing stay the same. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know whether this is really a thing in Sri Lanka, but certainly in Australia, uh, you know, we love to go to the beach and to take the family down to the beach and kids love to go to the beach. And you take some kids to the beach, and one thing that they're always doing is building sandcastles. This is it's like a this is a big, love love to do it. Um, and there was a uh, uh, something I saw uh, in the news some time ago. They're having it. They say like a museum. I think a museum, uh, a museum of toys where they preserve the culturally significant toys and games throughout history. And uh, so the latest entrant into that was sand. And in acknowledgement of the role that sand has played in uh, Toys for Kids. Now, here we're seeing a different kind of thing. So luckily, phew, we don't see the kids being cruel. So that's good. 
Uh, but what we see here is a creative impulse, also something which is very important, a creative impulse. And it's also a mimicry, isn't it? If we look back even before the time of the Buddha, you know, to the Indus Valley civilization, you know, so we're now talking a thousand years before the Buddha, uh, one of the very kind of striking remnants that you find from the archaeological remnants of that society were the uh, little chariots, toy chariots that were there, that were played with by kids. And they've been preserved all those years. And actually in the suttas, it refers to that. And the Buddha refers to the games played by children. And one of them is the rataka, the, the playing with toy, toy chariots. And of course, these days, still the same thing. Kids love to play with little cars and little vehicles or spaceships or whatever, something like that. So consistent that the games the kids are playing throughout time. And that creative impulse... Right? So kids building a sandcastle are mimicking the things that they see the grown-ups doing. They are perhaps um, echoing and playing out things that they've seen or that they've done themselves from past lives as well. They are building the, the fantasy things that they've been taught in their stories. Right? So you hear stories about castles and so on. It always has this kind of magical impulse to it. And so you're playing out with these kinds of things. And, but what's interesting about that is that that creativity is then bound up with attachment. Right? So we become attached to the things that we create and it comes from that impulse. And as long as you're, uh, um, you're attached to it, then you take great care. And when you're not attached to it, you just scatter it. And Again, this, this is kind of interesting. I mean, it's reminiscent in the Tibetan tradition. They have these sand mandalas where they will, they will kind of make these beautiful, intricate uh, patterns of mandalas with the, uh, out of sand. And then at the end of it, it's all impermanent. So they will just brush it away and it will, it will disappear and it's just gone. And so this is like a kind of performance art. And so it's a bit similar to what we're seeing here with the kids and doing their creative works. So this, again, is giving us an interesting idea of how to engage with children through doing creative work in Dhamma. Right? So kids have this creative impulse. Here at Sandcastles, it might be painting, it might be writing, it might be uh, creating TikTok videos, it might be whatever it is. Right? But there's also that thing of the attachment. And so we can use these ideas to be teaching these ideas of attachment. Right? And that can be something that, that could be quite a fun lesson, right? You could, I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, but we could do like a, uh, get kids to do a drawing during a class. And then at the end of the class, put them all in a pile and burn them. I mean, you tell them this beforehand, right? So you don't just <laughs> spring it on them, right? So, you know, you to explain why you're doing it. And then this can be a way that, you know, you can use to, to spark those kinds of reflections. So this is just an, another kind of thought that was an interesting idea that, um, uh, that showed us another side of children's behavior and how that relates to the Dhamma. Okay, um, I'll, we'll look at one more uh, sutta here before we come back to some Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so this one... Okay, so this is this is again is a different one, and this is uh, it's a slightly longer sutta, and this is a bit a uh, bit more probably a bit more uh, young adult ish. It's a bit hard to say actually. The the ages of the students is not specified here. We know that. Uh, so this is talking about Brahmanical students. We know that Brahmanical students were taken up when they were quite young. Uh, so they, they, or they could be taken when they're quite young. So my sense is with these that they're probably teenagers, um, but I guess we're probably not exactly sure what their age is. Anyway, let's just go through the story. So this is, um, uh, this is from the Sangyuta Nikaya, Sangyuta Nikaya number 35.132, the uh, Lohicha Sutta. At one time, Venerable Mahakachana was staying in the land of the Avantis at a wilderness hut near Makarakata. Then several youths, students of the Brahman Lohicha, 
approached Mahakachana's wilderness hut while collecting firewood. They wandered and walked and wandered all around the hut, making a dreadful racket and all kinds of jeers. These shavelings, fake ascetics, riffraff, black spawn from the feet of our kinsman, the Lord. They are honored, respected, esteemed, and revered by those who pretend to inherit Vedic culture. Interesting set of accusations here. And then Mahakachana left his dwelling and said to those Brahmin students, students, stop being so noisy. I will speak to you on the teaching. And when this was said, the students fell silent and Mahakachana recited these verses for them. The Brahmins of old excelled in ethics and remembered the ancient traditions. Their sense doors were guarded, well protected, and they had mastered anger. Those Brahmins who remembered the ancient traditions enjoyed virtue and absorption. But these have lost their way. Claiming to recite, they live out of balance, judging everyone by their clan. Mastered by anger, they take up many arms, attacking both the strong and the weak. All is vain for someone who doesn't guard the sense doors, like the wealth a person finds in a dream. Fasting, sleeping on bare ground, bathing at dawn, the three Vedas, rough hides, dreadlocks and dirt, hymns, precepts and observances and self-mortification, those fake bent staffs and rinsing with water, these emblems of the Brahmins are only used to generate profits. A mind that's serene, clear and undisturbed, kind to all creatures, that's the path of attainment to Brahman. Then those students, offended and upset, went to the Brahman Lohitya and said to him, please, master, you should know this. The ascetic Mahakachana condemns and rejects outright the hymns of the Brahmins. When they said this, Lohitya was offended and upset. Then he thought, but it wouldn't be appropriate for me to abuse or insult the ascetic Mahakachana solely because of what I've heard from these students. Why don't I go and ask him about it? Then the Brahman Lohitya, together with the students, went to Venerable Mahakachana and exchanged greetings with him. And he sat down to one side and said to him, Mahakachana, did these several young students of mine come by here collecting firewood? Oh, they did, Brahman. Did you have some discussion with them? I did, but what kind of discussion did you have? And he repeated those verses. Master Kachana spoke of someone who doesn't guard the sense doors. How do you define someone who doesn't guard the sense doors? Brahman, take someone who sees a sight with their eyes. If it's pleasant, they hold on to it. But if it's unpleasant, they dislike it. They live with mindfulness of the body unestablished and their heart restricted. And they don't truly understand the freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom where those arisen bad unskillful qualities unskillful qualities cease without anything left over when they hear a sound with their ears when they smell an odor with their nose when they taste a flavor with their tongue when they feel a touch with their body when they know a thought with their mind if it's pleasant they hold on to it but if it's unpleasant they dislike it they live with mindfulness of the body unestablished and a limited heart, but then they don't truly understand the freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom, where those arisen bad unskillful qualities cease without anything left over. That's how someone doesn't guard the sense doors. It's incredible, Mahakachan. It's amazing how accurately you've explained someone whose sense doors are unguarded. You also spoke of someone who does guard the sense doors. How do you define someone who does guard the sense doors? Brahman takes someone who sees a sight with their eyes. If it's pleasant, they don't hold on to it. And if it's unpleasant, they don't dislike it. They live with mindfulness of the body established and a limitless heart. And they truly understand the freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom, where those arisen, bad, unskillful qualities cease without anything left over. When they, see a, when they hear a sound with their ears, when they smell an odor with their nose, when they taste a flavor with their tongue, when they feel a touch with their body, when they know a thought with their mind. If it's pleasant, they don't hold on to it. And if it's unpleasant, they don't dislike it. They live with mindfulness of the body established and a limitless heart. And they truly understand the freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom where those arisen, bad, unskillful qualities cease without anything left over. That's how someone guards the sense doors. It's incredible, Mahakachana. It's amazing how accurately you've explained someone whose sense doors are guarded. Excellent, Mahakachana, excellent. As if he were 
writing the overturned or revealing the hidden or pointing out the path to the lost or lighting a lamp in the dark so people with good eyes can see what's there. Master Kachana has made the teaching clear in many ways. I go for refuge to the Buddha, to the teaching and to the mendicant Sangha. From this day forth, may my Kacha, Master Kachana remember me as a lay follower who's gone for refuge for life. Please come to my family, just as you go to the families of the lay followers in, the, in uh, Makarakta. The Brahmin boys and girls there will bow to you, rise in your presence and give you a seat in water. And that will be for their lasting welfare and happiness. All right, so it's a, a really nice sutta and um, it shows, again, I think, like, you know, so many of the times when we look at what's happening in these suttas, we see these interesting uh, exchanges and this like episode. And, you know, there's something about this to me that, that rings true where, you know, you can have the, the young students of a teacher who may be a kind of proud and, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of stuck on their knowledge and they're attached and they think they've got all the answers, you know, and I think that we've all seen uh, young people who are like that, who thought that they were smarter than everybody else, who thought they were better than everybody else, maybe even, and, you know, not meaning anybody personally, but maybe even we've been that person in the past and we know that person uh, uh, like we know ourselves. And but then their teacher has more wisdom. Right? The teacher's been around the block. Right? He's not attached to the former, but he recognizes well. You know, Mahakachana is. He's not trying to uh, dismiss our tradition or dismiss our learning or anything like that. But he's pointing out the fact that actually we're not really living up to the standards of the teaching that we should be doing. And that's actually a you know it's actually a valid critique, and we should be listening to it. And so he listens to what the uh, Mahakachana is saying. Uh, just briefly to comment on, on the teaching verse here of Mahakachana. Uh, so each goes through each of the six senses, and then it first, and then it talks about the um, uh, liking and disliking. So pleasant feeling stimulates that re that response. So to like it, to want more of it, the desire. Unpleasant feeling stimulates that reaction of aversion. So this is the first thing about sense restraint. It's not just about what you see or whatever, but it's about how you respond to it. Then the next part of it is you live with the mindfulness of the body established. Okay, so this is talking about meditation. So when the, when the suttas are talking about the establishment of mindfulness in this kind of way, normally they're talking about doing meditation. So to live with the mindfulness of the body established means practicing Satipatthana, practicing, uh, establishing mindfulness on the breath, on the posture of the body, and so on. And this is following in the gradual training, the Anapubhasika, this is following the sense restraint, um, practicing mindfulness of the body. Then they live uh, with a limitless heart. Yeah? And this is a, 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 a brief reference to jhanas. So jhanas are where the mind is free from the limits of the five hindrances, uh, and um, then that in turn leads to truly understanding the freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom, where those bad unskillful qualities cease without anything left over, which is talking about enlightenment, arahantship, where the mind is completely freed. So in this very brief statement uh, of Mahakachana, then he is already giving a, um, a very comprehensive uh, uh, explanation of the path of practice in Buddhism. So that's on that teaching. I'm just going to come back to the beginning of it because the setting of this is also interesting uh, and uh, a little bit unusual, uh, if not unique, in the Pali Canon. The first uh, unusual part is that uh, Mahakachana is, of course, one of the Buddha's great disciples, but here he was staying in the in Avanti. Now, Avanti is uh, down near uh, modern Maharashtra, somewhere around there. Uh, and it's a bit outside of the Buddha's normal area. So, you know, most of the suttas around Savati, Rajikaha, Vesali, and that kind of bit further to the north, sort of central north Ganges plain. Uh, and so here, uh, this, is, this is like uh, when, when a sutta begins without mentioning the Buddha. So notice that the Buddha isn't mentioned in the beginning here. Now, usually when that's the case, uh, that's because it's a sutta which is set after the Parinibbana. 
So this probably is referring to a time a few years after the Parinibbana when Mahakachana has moved to the southwest uh, and is staying in the land of the Avanti. So it's, it's representing a kind of a, uh, uh, an early stage in the spread of the Dhamma following the time of the Buddha. And it's interesting also that, that, that this idea that they're, they're honored, respected, re esteemed, revered by those who pretend to inherit Vedic culture. Now, this is a, it's a somewhat complex um, passage linguistically. I won't go into, it, into the details. This is, this is my reading of it. But the idea here is I think that um, the, the, um, uh, the, I think the word that they're using here is the Bharata. And so the, uh, the, that uh, uh, they're, they're in a way that they're saying that, you know, the people who are respecting the Buddhists, uh, they're not like real kind of Indians, if you like. They're not like real, you know, they're, they're, they, they say they're Aryans, they say they're part of our culture, but they're not really respecting our culture. And so this is what then Mahakachana responds by saying, well, actually, that many of the things that we talk about in Buddhism actually used to be found in that ancient Vedic culture, but many of them have been lost. Uh, so this is a kind of interesting sort of cultural kind of uh, scenario, as well as seeing the bit with the, the young people. Now, again, uh, uh, to see Mahakachana's response with the young students here, again, I mean, I'm guessing probably teenagers, um, you know, obviously they were misbehaving. I mean, it's a bit more of an adult kind of misbehavior than before, right? They're not just kids playing around with the animals or something like that, but it's a bit more intentional. You know, it's a bit kind of nasty. They're kind of a bit like trolls, right? They're hanging out on social media and they're just kind of harassing somebody because they're different. Yeah, I mean, Mahakachayan is not hurting anybody. <laughs> He's just sitting in his hut doing his meditation and they still kind of feel the need to just harass him and annoy him for nothing. And but Mahakachayana doesn't respond with anger. He doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't yell at the kids. He doesn't, you know, try to punish them or anything like that. But instead, he calls them along and he engages with them. Now, when he engages with them, he doesn't try too hard to mollify them, right? He's not, he's not like indulging them or uh, anything like that. He's, he's, he's giving a pretty direct teaching, which is pretty, you know, it's, it's not going to be, he knows it's not going to be an easy thing for them to hear, uh, you know, to hear that the tradition that they're practicing has fallen into corruption compared to what it could be. And so again, you can see that even though it's a very different context to what we've seen before, but Mahakachan is continuing that a precedent that the Buddha laid down of treating young people with respect, right? He's, he's teaching, he's treating them as people. These are people who I can have a discussion with in good faith, even though they've behaved badly, right? They've been harassing me and annoying me, and they've been behaving like very annoying teenagers, but I'm still going to engage with them as if they were intelligent, as if they cared, as if they had sincerity and integrity, and I'm going to treat them with dignity as human beings. And that's how he's going to engage with them. Now, okay, fine, but it didn't work, right? <laughs> and they're like, oh, blah, 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 still angry and so on. And then they go off and they complain about it, right? Also good, good to bear in mind because very often that's what happens when you try to do that. It can be very depressing because you try to pe treat people with dignity and respect. You try to give them the benefit of the doubt. You try to have a civil conversation with them, and yet it seems like they're not even trying, right? They're not even doing anything to, to come onto your side. And so it can feel very exhausting and disillusioning. Why do I even bother, right? Why didn't I, why didn't, you know, I mean, I, I, that's how I would have felt if I was Mahakachana and that had happened, right? And I'd spoken to the kids and then they went off grumbling, complaining. I'd be like, uh, why did I bother? I should have just told those kids to get lost, right? It would have been much easier. Let's get out of here, kids. And I wouldn't have had to bother about trying to engage with them in that way. But <laughs> it, it's not as simple as that. Because even though it seemed to not work, right? the initial impression that didn't work, but oh, they told their teacher and their teacher didn't do what they thought. 
their teacher, the Brahmanical teacher, Lohita, he's like, hmm, actually, this monk has some has a point. Oh, actually, I should listen myself. And he's giving a good example for the kids. This is really this is really essential here, right? Uh, the Brahman Lohitcha is setting a good example for the kids. He was offended and upset, but then he thought, I shouldn't insult him solely on what I've heard from second hand. I should go and ask him about it. what a great teacher that is. So I just stop and think about that for a minute. What a great teacher. He didn't dismiss what his students say, right? He didn't ignore it or dismiss it at all. But at the same time, he didn't just take it all for granted. But he said, no, I'm going to go and talk to him and check it out for myself. And he followed where the path of truth led him. And then when he heard what Mahachakachana was teaching, he knew that it made sense. Uh, and so he... Uh, uh, <laughs> No doubt the kids were kind of a bit upset. He said, I'm going to get them to make sure that they bow and they pay respects to you. And what a great example of a teacher that is. And this is another thing which I think is really important for us to understand. You know, just think about it. Think about what's happening with this teacher and his students. They've probably been with him for years. They would go, they would stay there. They would probably be reciting Vedic verses like every day. They'd probably be having lessons on the, the teachings and the traditions and all of those kinds of things. And he's been spending years trying to transmit his knowledge of his tradition to them. And yet, with one challenge, they're completely thrown off. They start behaving in this really obnoxious way and they lose it. Yeah? I mean, that, it, that, it's quite distressing for a teacher to be in that situation. You're thinking, I put so much effort into these kids and they just ignore it. Yeah? But what does Lohitcha do? Lohitcha sets a good example. And that's what's make the difference. What's make the, that's what makes the difference for him and also for his kids. It's not just what you teach them. It's how you live. And that's the most important thing. And if we as parents and as elders and as seniors, if our thought is how do we transmit the Dhamma to our children, the number one thing that we can do, far more important than anything else, is to live in accordance with the Dhamma. Kids will see what we are doing and they will know if we tell them, don't lie, here we're going to recite Musavada we Ramani and then the parents go and lie, and kids will know. If the, if the parents are saying, let's recite Sura Merai Imagine Pamadatana, and they've got a cabinet full of liquor and they're drinking wine at mealtime, the kids will know. They will know if you're being hypocritical. They'll know if you're not practicing. If the, if the parents are saying, have metta, but then as soon as you do something wrong, they get angry with you and yell at you and hit you, the children know. This is how they know. And this is the number one thing that is going to bring people to the Dhamma. This is the lesson that we can learn here from Lohitcha. Yeah? Lohitcha responded as a good teacher should do and as a good elder should do. He set a good example. And that's going to make a deeper impression on his students than all of those lessons and classes. Okay. So I'm going to stop screen sharing just for now, uh, approaching near the end. I think we've got a few questions. Shall we? Uh, let's have a look at a couple of the questions here and uh, we will see what people have had to say. So please do submit your, uh, any questions that you've got. I really love to see that and it's love to see people paying attention. Okay, so Anonymous, another anonymous attendee. How are you, Anonymous? I hope that you are happy and that your family and friends are happy. So, so Anonymous begins. This might be a really tough question. Great. Thank you. I like tough questions. And not relevant to this session, but as a young person myself, I've always wondered, what is the significance of having Buddha statues? Did the Buddha himself want us to have statues? No. To, to, what is the significance to our chanting to them? Uh, well, it depends. I've seen sometimes statues placed in gold and so on. What is the significance of this? Well, the significance of a Buddha statue essentially is that it provides a means for us to remember the Buddha and to um, 
what, what a Buddhist statue does is it, uh, it embodies in a physical way those qualities which we revere in the person of the Buddha, the qualities of peace, the qualities of wisdom, the qualities of balance and harmony. And so this is an expression by artists and creative people to represent this in a physical way. And that's a part of humanity, to express ourselves creatively, like we saw with the kids playing with the sandcastles. It's, it's a natural part of humanity. And we've seen from the earliest times that there have been ways of expressing um, uh, uh, Buddhism through visual imagery. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of, a, it, it will be a bit beside the point, but in the earliest times, no, there weren't any Buddha images. And they first appeared maybe three or 400 years after the time of the Buddha. Before that, the Buddha was represented by a Bodhi tree or by a Dhamma wheel or some symbolic form, but not as a per in, in person. So, uh, you know, we don't need to have Buddha images. One of my, my friends, uh, Venerable Dhamma Woodho, a Malaysian uh, monk who passed away a few years ago, but he, in his uh, monastery, the Gautama Buddha Vihara, uh, he didn't have any Buddha images. And he said in the time of the Buddha, they never had any Buddha images, so I'm not going to have any Buddha images. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. So Buddha images also are beautiful, and they are a reminder uh, of those qualities of the Buddha. So uh, if we think of them as sort of magical things that's going to solve all our problems or something, it's probably not what the Buddha taught. But if we use them to remind ourselves uh, and to help to focus our mind, then I think that's something which is very nice. All right. Now we have a second question here from Winyu Kapila. So Winyu, I hope you are well and your family as well. Thank you for asking the question. So Winyu's talking about meditation. Okay. Okay, so it's quite a long paragraph about meditation. Let's see how we go. Uh, let me just begin by saying, Minyu, that I'm a bit cautious about giving too much like personal instruction on meditation, especially over the internet or something, because you know you really have to get to know a person and to know what they're doing and all of those things before being able to teach meditation. So please do just take anything that I say uh, under advisement. If it's useful for you, then that's great. If it's not useful for you, then just please leave it to one side. Before starting a meditation, uh, normally I'll do a body scan. Good. Then monitoring in breath and out breath. Okay, fine. After which I start to contemplate the Four Noble Truths, 12 links of dependent origination, and uh, in forward and reverse order. At the end of the above contemplations, normally I'll see a little star. Hmm sometimes very bright, sometimes a bit dim in between and above my eyebrow and feeling very peaceful, okay? This little star stays for a while after I bring the mindfulness back to the breath and open my eyes. It will then break into tiny particles and fade away. The peaceful feeling remains much longer for a few hours. But appreciate if Bhante would guide me on how to go forward in my practice. Well, first of all, that sounds wonderful. I mean, this is... <laughs> That sounds really beautiful that you can do this practice and find that peace within yourself. Yeah? And you're, you're integrating uh, that, that peace together with the understanding and the Dhamma side of things is there. So this is a nice uh, practice and it's clearly is working well for you. So that's, that's really good to see. Um, the advice that I would give here would be that um, when, if you feel that, that, okay, so when you feel that that little star appearing or something like that, then um, this is this is this obviously this is what we call the nimitta or the like the reflection of the mind. Now, what the what the nimitta is is it's it's like it's like the mind describing itself to itself. Okay, so when the nimitta appears, what it means is that your mind is giving itself a sign. That's what nimitta literally means is a sign. Your, 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 your mind is giving itself a sign to say, oh, your meditation is going well. Right? The light goes on, oh, yeah, your meditation is going well. And that corresponds to uh, the, when the hindrances are starting to become quiet and starting to disappear. Right? So that's great. One of the things to do is to, uh, uh, one of the um, fallacies we can fall into at that point is that we mistake the sign for the journey. So you can think that the sign 
is the important thing. Actually, the sign is just the sign. It's like literally just you're walking along the road and there's a sign on the side of the road. The sign says Nibbana, but it doesn't mean you're at Nibbana. It means that <laughs> the signpost is pointing you to Nibbana. Yeah? It just means you're on the road. Actually, Nibbana or to Jhanas, actually. This is a, a Jhana Nimitta, but this is a sign that's saying Jhanas are up ahead, right? Keep going. And so this is good. So, but what do you do, right? Actually, what you do is you keep walking. You keep doing what we were doing before because the sign is telling you it's working. You're on the right path. So it's not telling you to do something else. It's telling you keep doing what you were doing before. So in your case, you're doing breath meditation. Keep doing that. And when you see that light, then keep coming back to your breath and coming back and being more and more subtle with the breath and, to, and take that as far as you can go. It's the breath that will be the foundation that will lead you to deep meditation. Yeah? So keep on coming back to that breath. The sign is a sign. Yeah? But the breath is what is your path to Nibbana. Okay. So I hope that's helped when you, helpful for you, Vinya. But like I said, uh, without talking to you in person, then it's difficult for me to give too much specific information. But I hope that's helpful for you. Okay. I think we've just about run out of time. Is, is that right, Lakshman? Yeah, yeah, just about right. Uh... Oh, dear. Okay. So, um, do you want to have any messages before we finish up? Uh, yeah, yeah. I will uh, just say a few, uh, few messages, uh, Bante. Uh, much merit to Bante because, in fact, uh, it was a very, very good. Uh, uh, Dhamma sermon because although we said the Buddha speaks with young people, I think uh, all the messages were for the uh, uh, the parents and others who are listening because uh, as uh, Bhante mentioned, uh, we have to set an example. Uh, that's how the children will be able to follow uh, the Buddha Dhamma and I think uh, that is something that we need to follow. Uh, but I want to make a few uh, announcements. First thing is that uh, the link that has been uh, that you have received will be valid for the uh, uh, for the next uh, three uh, sutta sessions that we are having. Uh, so please uh, use that. And uh, in the event, if you have any uh, thing that you can always email to us and let us know. And you will also get a reminder uh, because that is uh, sent to you. And as Bhante mentioned, Zoom is also helping us a great deal in uh, these matters by. Uh, uh, sending these minders uh, as per our instructions. So uh, we are very uh, thankful to uh, uh, the Zoom also for helping us. Uh, then the other thing is that we also, uh, uh, which I also suggested and Pante is also agreed, is that we want to invite uh, more uh, uh, young uh, people, young um, uh, youth or the youth. Uh, maybe uh, your children or your grandchildren who can come because uh, we feel that that will also help them. And we, we also want to give them some topics uh, relating to what uh, Bhante's uh, sermons are uh, in order that uh, we will give them an opportunity to write an essay, uh, about approximately about 750 to 1,000 uh, words. Uh, and we are hoping that it could be done after the second uh, uh, session that we are having next week and uh, thereafter that they could send the answer and we would be able to give them a feedback in the uh, final session. So that's what uh, we are planning. What we think is that if uh, uh, everyone would be able to get another, uh, maybe a youth uh, to attend with them, that will be, uh, I think, a great way to assist uh, our uh, session that we are having because uh, this will not only give the message to the parents, but also to their children and also others. So uh, they are all uh, welcome. And uh, please see whether if you can do that, that would be a great uh, source of encouragement and will also help because we are also looking at ways and means as to how uh, the message can be uh, given to the youth. And in that respect, uh, Bhante has uh, given this very, very important topic of uh, uh, 
uh, Buddha's message, but we now have to see how we can interpret to the youth. So that's a very, very important area. I must thank uh, Deepika also for giving all the ideas and suggestions on this. And uh, that would be uh, one. Then, uh, yeah, I think there, those are the main things. Of course, the timing would be the same. That's Sri Lanka time, uh, uh, 10 to uh, 12. That's the time that we have set. And of course, uh, for in Australia, it will be 3.30, that's Sydney and Melbourne, 3.30 to 5.30, that's the time that is there. But I think for other areas also, there would be an adjustment in the time that we have done of uh, half an hour. So uh, those are the main things. Plus also, I must just tell you that uh, wherever possible, that you can go into the uh, Sutta Central. I think some of them have said that uh, uh, they may have certain difficulties where I think... Uh, uh, Deepika has already told them that if there's anything to let her know. But I will also appreciate if, uh, uh, because when we are doing all these things, we also have to see how we can help uh, uh, suit the central. And if you, uh, I had already sent you all the details uh, relating to any donations that you can make, kindly see, uh, you can do it because that will also give a lot of merit uh, for uh, uh, to you for uh, helping uh, to carry on the activities and be of uh, uh, great benefit to the Buddhism. So those are the things. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Bante, about the essay. Bante, you want to uh, mention a few things about uh, the essay and maybe uh, what uh, we are expecting out of that? Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's a bit of a bit of a kind of a trial, a bit of an experiment, and I think so we just see how it goes. Uh, but I think like, like it, it's 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 extremely important that uh, uh, we learn through dhamma expression, not just through dhamma absorption. And so my history teacher always used to say that if you can't explain something, then you don't really understand it. So to sort of get get kids to be able to try to uh, explain something uh, is going to be really helpful for um, for for learning. And so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of try this out and then see how it goes. But, you know, like I said before, I think that, I think we have to, we have to, we have to innovate. We have to try new things because how, how the conditions that we're in, the society that we're in, the technologies that we're using, these are always, always changing. And so, you know, let's try it out and we'll see, see how it goes. And we may get some really interesting things. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, I must yeah. also say that the age limit will be below 26 years. That's what we have put, but maybe uh, if there are one or two years difference, yeah. it does not matter. But uh, try to see, because as I said, if you can uh, invite, uh, bring with you for the next session, uh, uh, some uh, person, uh, youth, I think that will be a great achievement. Uh, Deepika, would you like to say something before I invite uh, Kamal? Um, no, I, I'm fine, Professor Vatamula. Thank you for um, collaborating uh, with Sutta Central to do these great sessions. And much merit. That's all from me. Thank you, Deepika, for all, all your support and assistance. Uh, can I now invite uh, Kamal, our uh, one of our um, committee members who's been playing a very major role, uh, to pay uh, merit to Bhante Sujan? You have to unmute uh, Kamal. Thank you, Lakshman. Buddhist night to all. On behalf of the International Dhamma Program, much merit to Bhante Ajahn Sujato, co-founder of the Sutta Central .net Sydney. Once again, today was the third session, the beginning of the third session of the Dhamma series. And the talk was very, very interesting about the Buddha's teachings to approach the youngsters. And it, uh, Bhante pointed out some points, one about respect, two engaging, and three addressing with the common grounds. We are very, very indebted to suttacenter.net and also to Ms. Deepika for coordinating it with the International Dhamma Program. And much merit to you, Bhante. Thank you very much. And we today we had over 130 Dhamma friends worldwide. And thank you very much for participating. And we look forward to the next session on the 17th. Finally, we want to thank Professor 
whatever for all the coordination and and activities and keeping us up to date, sending us timely emails and reminders so that we are all ready. And I mean, this is very, very appreciated. Much merit to you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lakshman. Uh, thank, thank you, Kamal. Uh, Bante, can we pay merit to the Devas uh, departed and sure. uh, of course, uh, for those who are affected by COVID? Yes, of course, yeah. Akasakha chivamattha devanaga mahidhika kanyantam anuditva chirangrakham juloka sasanam. Akasakha chivamattha devanaga mahidhika kanyantam anuditva chirangrakham tudesanam. Akasakha chivamattha devanaga mahidhika Punyantanamoditwa <laughs> Eta vata cham he sam bhatam punya sam padang sabbe satta anumodan tu sab sam pati sidhya idam menya ti nam ho tu sukhita hon tu nyatayo idam menya ti nam ho tu sukhita hon tu nyatayo idam menya ti nam ho tu sukhita hon tu nyatayo Sadhu, 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 much merit to one face, yes. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, sadhu. Okay, everybody, be happy. And look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much. Professor Thank you, Bhante. Thank you. Thank you.